Hello, my name is Gene Contover, and this is The Current Buzz. Today we have a person that was in Afghanistan, and we're going to talk about Afghanistan for this next half hour. So please stay tuned. His name is John Moses. He's on the school committee in Chepstow, Massachusetts. But that's not what he's here for. He's here for his experience. He was, uh, you were in Taliban. You were in Kuwait for two tours and Afghanistan for one tour. So you have an understanding of what's going on and what went on in, in in uh, Afghanistan. Um, we're going to talk about what he did with the EVAC fellows, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an article in the uh, Lowell Sun, September 5th, 2021, about his experiences in regards to trying to get people out. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what happened in Kabul and the pros and cons of that. So uh, welcome to the show. Appreciate you coming in at a short notice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, tell me, uh, oh, also we're gonna talk about uh, things called Slack channel, WhatsApp app, and Signal uh, app. So you'll know um, what we're talking about. There are certain apps that were used in regards to trying to get people out of Kabul. And um, we're gonna talk about that. So when he brings it up, I'm gonna ask him, what that is, okay? Um, also, um, Afghanistan's a locked, landlocked country, uh, so it was very difficult once they control the airport to get flights in and out. Uh, they could have been shot down. There could have been a lot of factors. They could have been squeezed into a perimeter smaller uh, than that. So um, let's talk about your experience in Afghanistan. It blows up. We pull, we're going to pull out. Uh, we have uh, guys prepositioned. We had Marines pre-positioned in, in Kuwait um, out of the uh, aircraft carrier Iwo Jima. Uh, they were the expeditionary force. And then the, um, the 82nd Airborne was on standby also, which came in and were at the airport. Don't forget about those Missouri National Guard guys, because those guys were uh, rock stars. They were the first people there. <laughs> Wait, who? There was a Missouri National Guard unit in one other state that uh, were actually stationed in Kuwait and beat the 82nd Airborne. They were the first people there, and they secured the perimeter. It was, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I didn't even know yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> the Marines were uh, in Marines Kuwait. Marines were there, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, the American government did pre-plan for this. I mean, it wasn't just uh, willy-nilly. At it, 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 the beginning, it was, to me, I told people it's like a divorce. It's hectic at the beginning, and then it kind of mellows out, and once it's settled, it's... It's, it goes. But I want to hear your story. All right, all of a sudden this happens. Blue, people get in contact with you. What happened? Yeah, so to, first of all, thank you for having me on, Dean. Yeah, I no appreciate problem. it. And I appreciate the opportunity to kind of tell the story um, specifically as it relates to a lot of the, you know, for me, the veteran community really came together on this okay. um, and to help these people that we took care of for so long. The Afghan um, veteran community? No, the American uh, veteran America. community. Okay, good to hear. So, and I'll talk a little bit about how the right. operation went and some of the people we worked with. Okay. And, um, but for me, the story really started uh, when, when the Capitol fell, and quite frankly, I don't remember what day it was, but I got a phone call at 3 in the morning from my former interpreter. You mean Capitol Kabul? Kabul, yeah. yes. And when I say the Capitol, uh, yeah. I should say uh, yeah. Kabul. i got to stop speaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I um, got a, got a, received a phone call three in the morning from my former interpreter who's in California, and uh, he just he called me, and I answered the phone, and he said, my brother's in Afghanistan. He's in Kabul. Can you help? And, you know, I wasn't thinking a lot about it or how intensive it was going to be and how am I going to help people that far away. And um, I just started working on his brother's case. I started trying to help him and trying to figure it out. And then as I worked through it, we found out there was other veterans and that we weren't alone. So there were several days where it was a very lonely period trying to figure out how to help this one family. Mm -hmm. And then I found another veteran that I knew that was helping. And then we would find uh, you know, a former US aid worker that was helping. And then that group um, of people that had done so much work in Afghanistan for the Afghans um, really started to coalesce. And some of those tools you mentioned, um, WhatsApp, uh, Signal, you know, those were the primary communication tools between us and Kabul and the other different groups. Signal's an encrypted app. Um, They're encrypted apps. Yeah, I yeah. just want to let you know. That's what these apps, yep. uh, Slack, uh, WhatsApp, and encrypted means. Yep. Yeah, so we call this the emergency <coughs> portion of the EVAC. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we use things like Slack, which is another collaboration tool uh, that all these people came together. And caseworkers like me and other groups uh, ended up finding these other groups that had, you know, intel assets to help us get us over the wall, to get Afghans over the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, we focused on SIVs. SIVs, um, 
didn't have direct access to the gate, so they went through an entire vetting process. Special and, immigrant visa, I'm sorry. I know, no, you're right, Dean. Yeah, all right. That's Special all right. immigrant visa, yeah. which is a process that takes uh, anywhere from eight to ten years to go through. <laughs> Why? Um, and <coughs> So this goes a long way back, but the SIV communities in Afghanistan, those people that applied, um, going back many administrations, uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe were properly supported, even during the middle of the war, mm -hmm. during the long, you know, dark, mm -hmm. when not a lot of people were talking about Afghanistan, it was still taking seven and eight years. And a lot of it has to do with staffing right. um, and things like that. But for me, it was really about the evac <coughs> and, and the evacuation. So during that emergency evac, hundreds and hundreds of people worked together to uh, move people around on the ground. It was a period where our group had four interpreters uh, that were special forces interpreters that were being hunted by the Taliban. Um, we had them moving around. Kabul. American special forces or they were, Afghani special forces? They were interpreters for American special forces. So they were, they were <coughs> targeting. These guys should be pulled out. Really. Right. Yeah. And um, that was the first group we got out. And essentially, we, we made contacts with old DOD, Department of Defense people, old you know military people we knew. And then we went through um, and made contacts behind the wall. And, uh, and you know, you were military and you understand this, um, but there were was, there was some heroes, absolute heroes behind that wall. Um, behind were, the wall or on the other side of the wall? Behind the wall in the airport, okay. there were okay. these absolute lions, mm -hmm. including those 13 people that died. Um, those people that we were communicating with on these, these applications were finding <coughs> soft spots in the wall where they could bring in Afghans and coming outside of the wall to bring in groups of people that just were looking How for far outside are we talking about? Uh, I mean, 10 feet is pretty far. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Those I, conditions. I, I'm just saying one kilometer, or, you know. No, I, they I were. Um, that, was, that was the case, yeah. There were gaps in the wall yeah. that we were able to find with uh, satellite imagery and with people on the ground um, kind of, you know, scouting it out and finding uh, weak spots. Um, not weak spots, but places that we could get people in. And we would coordinate between us, you know, thousands of miles away. We'd get people to a point, and we'd get them in the wall. And that was the, that was the first part of the back. That was the... In the phone, you could be tracked. So yep. were they being tracked? Uh, they, I, we have to assume they were. Okay. Uh, but at that first two yeah. weeks, that, that two weeks when Kabul fell, yeah. it was all emergency. It was, yeah. you know, it was really loose. We were making... There's a term in the military, uh, but I won't go... I know which one you're To the walls, about. yeah. We've used it a few times. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But that was the emergency portion. Yeah. And then after, you know, towards the end when we had gotten, at that point we had, my group had gotten, our group, excuse me, had gotten about 68 people out and then the gates closed. And um, I had at that point picked up a bunch of legal permanent resident families, which are families that live in the United States, have families here, generally are working on citizenship. Um, and they've been, a large portion of them are still there although uh, we did get one out this morning, which was a really good news. That's good to hear. Uh, yeah. You've been trying to get that person out for mm -hmm. uh, three or four weeks now, right? Yeah. Am I correct? Talk to her every day. Uh, uh, how? Uh, uh, through uh, WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Talk every was day. she on the run? She was not on the run, um, but she was alone. And in Kabul with the Taliban in charge, being a, a, a alone uh, is not safe. How'd she feed herself? Um, so she had, uh, she did have money when she went there because she oh. had traveled from the U.S. Okay. So she was good for food. Oh. Uh, she did run out of medicine, so we had to, you know, we ended up working with a, a non-government organization, a private organization, to deliver her medicine. But even that, and uh, you know, just to talk about her experience, um, in short, she was during the emergency part of the evac. She was beaten up by the Taliban. She was shot at by the Taliban. She almost made it in a gate, um, and she could see the Marines, but was pushed away. And then she, we by thought, who? Um, by the Taliban. By the Taliban. Oh. Taliban. And they don't push with their hands either. So No, they have the whips. 30-something-year-old yeah. woman, three-year-old you know, three -year -old son in California. She's got a California license. Mm -hmm. um, and then we thought we lost her at Abbey Gate. And then she disappeared. And we thought, you know, we thought the worst had happened. Mm -hmm. We had another chance to evac her, and we sent her on a, to a bus that was supposed to go to the airport that, that was then hijacked and she was shot at and she ran for her life again and went into hiding and she's been in hiding ever since until this morning. Was she covered up? She had to cover up. Um, when she had to go pick up her medicine, um, she was assaulted by the Taliban then because she was alone and she had to Oh, that's her. right. You can't, yeah. you need a male accompaniment, yeah. right? Uh, but I will say through the effort of, I mean, just a lot of people, um, Congresswoman Trahan's office has been helping. Um, that's I reached out directly to, um, the White House and Let, in, let's give know. Sarah um, uh, what's her name Sarah Len uh, Lung. Lung, yeah, yeah. yeah 
Let's give her some credit because she helped you. Yeah. Right. yeah. So every um, every so special right. immigrant visa packet yeah. that came through, uh, every every American citizen that came through, um, we pushed all of those packets through Lori Trahan's office. And mm -hmm. Lori Trahan's office pushed those up to the appropriate task force. And I'm just a you know I'm just a solo person. This yeah. isn't my full time job. Mm -hmm. um, so tracking and paperwork and all of that stuff, they help with all that. And then you know I asked her for legal services, and she gave us pro. You know she said we've we've we're working with a law firm. You now have pro bono legal services for these SIVs, immigration wow. lawyers. Oh, wow, yeah. good. And it, and I do. So want, was she dealing with the State Department too? She is. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. All yeah. Right. And I do want to say, and, and you know Maria Santos, who is also on the school committee with me. <coughs> Is also doing pro bono cases. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So some of the harder. I like cases, to get her on on my show. I mean, she's she's wonderful. Yeah. And you know, the thing about all of this was when we went to people and we said these people need your help. Nobody said no. Not a single person came back and said no. So Maria Santos, Sarah, Lori Trahan's office, the hundreds of people all across the country, um, in the world that helped us with intel, and moving people, and then this particular group that got our one on the flight today. Are just they're just heroes. They're just okay. So uh, she flew out of Kabul. She this had morning. she had a green card. Yep. A green card means that you can stay in this country as long as you want, as long as you have a green card. Usually, what happens is if you have a green card, you go from a green card to citizenship, yep. and you get naturalization papers, etc. That type of thing. So I'm sure when she gets back. She's going to be naturalized American citizen yeah. because when you travel on the green card, you you travel with the passport of, a of the of original country. Yep. So she was traveling with an Afghani passport with a green card. And a lot of people who are not educated, like the Taliban, I hate to say some people in the Taliban, don't know the difference. Yeah, I mean, the Taliban, you know, for what it's worth, they're good at fighting, right? They, they, yeah. so a lot of them grew up in the mountains the in southern Afghanistan, yeah. very rural. They don't know how to read. Um, so you show them something different than a U.S. passport yeah. or something than... You know, other than a physical green card, and yeah. she only had the stamp, which was a whole other issue. Um, On the passport, she had the green yeah. card stamp. Oh, yeah. But, um, okay, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, long and short of it is, she ended up sitting in an apartment for almost three weeks. Just uh, sometimes they had power, sometimes they didn't. She did find a friend to stay with, thank God. But uh, most of our time, as Kate, and there are other people just like her, by the no way. Doubt. I have other no families doubt about that it. are not out yet. Um, but. She, uh, most of it was trying to keep them calm and keeping them hopeful because it was really very dire for them. Uh, they didn't feel, and I don't feel like they had the same protections as the, uh, the blue American passport. Right, right. And uh, it was a struggle. And, you know, we have people right now, I had a guy sleeping in a park with his mom and dad just because they have no more money and they have no more food. And we can't, we can do some things for that. There are groups that are helping with that. But for me, my role and my job <coughs> is to get people on the plane and on a manifest and back to where they belong. When you found out today that that uh, young lady uh, got on the plane, how'd you feel? <laughs> to tell you, I, yeah. um, I don't even, I don't even know how to express it. She's she she's been so fragile and yet so brave. Um, it's just been. Yeah, it's a lot. And I haven't really processed it yet, and she hasn't landed yet, and until she lands, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really going to be comfortable. But I will say, though, I just really quick, you know, one of the things she did when she was in the airport, she stayed three days in the airport. She slept on the floor for three days yeah, with, well, with a bunch of other people. Yeah, you have to and do what you have to do. You have to do what you have to yeah. do. And um, this organization was great. They fed her. They gave her help. Mm -hmm. But there was a point where she tried to take a picture of some of the Taliban that were in the airport. Oh, boy. And they, they saw her, and they knocked her phone out of her hand and said, cut it out, broke her phone, whatever. And then I said, you got to be careful now. No, you, can't, you can't do that. Like, mm -hmm. I, I need you to be safe. I need you to get on the plane. Mm -hmm. And she went back, and she found those Taliban again and took a picture. And I asked her, why did you go back to take a picture? And she said, because, because she, wanted, she wanted people to see who those people were, mm -hmm. who they really were. And, I th and it was the bravest thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, no, I'm thrilled she's on the plane. All right, she will call you up, I'm sure. Yeah, she's, she'll probably message me when she gets to wherever, yeah. she, whatever the next destination yeah, yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, and uh, it, it's it's really interesting. Um, the, the interpreters basically, what, speak pa Pashu and Dari? Is yeah, so Farsi, Dari, they're the same Pashto. thing, or Pashto, Pashto yeah. Okay. Um, and those guys, and those interpreters are very exposed. There's pictures of, you know, there's pictures of them with, with Americans. Yeah. And um, the other really at-risk uh, group, and there's spe groups specializing in this, are pilots. 
the, uh, the Taliban uh, reserves special disdain for the Afghan pilots because they did so much damage to the Taliban. Yeah, but you would want to, people who have that experience to fly your planes or your helicopters nah, if you can. That's not the situation. No. No, the situation is, is dire for them. So there's a group of uh, former military general officers trying to help specifically with pilots because they're in so much danger. I know some of the pilots went uh, uh, flew up to uh, Tajikistan, uh, 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 Uzbekistan, or maybe yep. Tajikistan. Too. All over the place. Everywhere yeah, they can everybody, fly. anybody they, that will take them. Uh, a lot of the pilots, the helicopter pilots, a lot of uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the fixed wing aircraft went uh, uh, up there. I don't know what they're going to do with that, those planes or not, but a lot of people there. Uh, in regards to when you were in Afghanistan, how did you get into country? G give me a real quick rundown. Yeah. You, you flew it. You cannot, you have to fly in. There's no ocean around Afghanistan. Nope. So it's a landlocked country. And there's like six or seven countries that surround yep. uh, Afghanistan. So when you're at the airport, and I heard a reporter say, well, are you going to go out in the, in the city and, and pick up these people to bring them back to the airport? Not. You're not going to bring American military into a city of six million people who can get cut off in the convoy yeah. and, and, and can become prisoners and hostages, and we don't have to deal with that. Yeah, no, that was the operation, right? And there was also agreements in place. Yeah, um, there's no doubt. There was agreements in place, and for me, uh, I think it made sense uh, for soldiers not to come out. Uh, but at the end of the day, what happened was an incredible group of private citizens and military and Department of Defense and U.S. state people all came together and did the work of getting people to there and to the gate. And you know, we got, during that first evac, we got 68 people out. But I can tell you in, with full confidence, we missed about 100. I mean, it was not a 100% game. It's a numbers game, mm -hmm. uh, how many people you're gonna get out. And yeah. Sometimes you gotta make hard choices. I had one group miss their, um, they missed their pickup spot. Another group um, couldn't get to the spot and they just didn't get in and they're still there. And uh, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, in regards to what, Abbey Gate was it? Yeah, Abbey yeah, Gate was 13, one of the gates we were the, the, Where the 13 uh, uh, mm -hmm. American military died, uh, one corpsman, one special forces guy, and the other were Marines, and two of them were women. Were they uh, inspecting the bags? Is that going in the gate? Because you had two women there, because you have to, yep. uh, under Islamic law, uh, men cannot search women, yeah. et cetera. I mean, aside from searching, which is one yeah. of the things they were doing, they were doing quick searches as they pulled them in. Mm -hmm. um, what those 13 men and women were doing, um, so after 20 years, you know, and I have some insight on this, and I have, you mm -hmm. know, some, some, some thoughts and, and some pretty deep-seated feelings about this. For 20 years, we were at war, you know, and soldiers were out killing people. That's mm -hmm. what soldiers do, right? right? They were out killing the Taliban yeah. and fighting and doing all that yeah. kind of stuff. Those 13 peoples on that last couple of days of the war um, were wading into a sea of humanity and finding people holding up uh, blue be, passports. Being a soldier, the, the, the best term I like is uh, uh, the best soldier is a nonviolent soldier. Yeah, they were saving uh, in America. Other, in other words, you, you don't have to go to war. You, you're yeah. there just to prevent so after, it. So after Good. 20 years Sorry. of death and destruction, um, these 13 soldier sailors, Marines, they waded into... Um, through a sewage trench. Mm -hmm. There was a sewage trench yep, right in front of that, that gate, and uh, they would walk out and they would look for Afghans holding up blue passports, and they would wade into the crowd and they would pull them in. So they were saving people, mm -hmm. and they were saving Americans. Mm -hmm. So um, I just think if it's the most honorable thing you can do. Is right. That's your, your, your job in the military is to protect Americans, and that's what those people did. Uh, you were in Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. You saw the corruption, explain yep. it real quick. Yeah, so I actually, so I worked at the uh, United States Embassy doing um, large scale uh, customs work with the right. Afghan government and it was a grift. The, uh, the Afghan government was incredibly corrupt. Everything was an attempt to take a bribe. Uh, the US government doesn't pay bribes, we didn't right. pay bribes. We flew all over that country trying to prevent people from trying to take bribes and move cargo. But every single government employee, not every, I, I, I will, there were some, there were some really Mist, wonderful, Mr. Zaheen was one of them that was just a wonderful Afghan that wanted a great country, mm -hmm. but most of that government was corrupt and it was about how much money they could make before we left, it, 100%. And it never changed from the time I got there to the time I left. And I'm sure it was that way to, since the beginning. So you were, you were basically going all over 
trying to discuss with customs people mm -hmm. at the borders, let's say uh, uh, Uzbekistan or yep. something like that. I've been that. there, Harrison border. I've been there. Yeah, so you were negotiating with these guys and saying, we're not going to pay you. We want that stuff to come in yeah. because it's landlocked. It is. So basically, everything we goes were over the ground. Screwed to a certain degree because it's landlocked. And it everything will. comes up through Pakistan, across the border yeah. into Afghanistan by. It's either Uzbekistan by, or Pakistan. There's a, there was a bunch people of. People don't understand that. Yeah, no, it's completely landlocked. And, um, and, you know, negotiating is a kind word for what we had to mm -hmm. do to get people to move cargo, but it was a lot of. You know, yelling and but the thing was is in 2011 and 12, and I think there's going to be a lot of time to reflect on our time there. But mm -hmm. I think everybody that worked with the Afghan government knew it wouldn't survive without the United States in the military. And then okay. I, this is just a guy working in the embassy, doing his job that happened to work with the government, and they were so corrupt. It, yeah, um, the, the president of the country for and just and I do want to say this, this is really important too. The Afghan army uh, gets a lot a lot of grief for having surrendered, mm -hmm. um, but that that army had suffered 22 percent casualties over the past two years, and their president, the leader of their country, got on a plane and flew yeah, away. Yeah, flew away. And they were starving because their commanders were stealing their food and selling it on. The yeah, they were market. short ammunition. Yeah. They were short. Short water. on everything, and there was no support. Yeah. There was no air support coming. Yeah, so. the, that's a big thing. In Vietnam, it was the air support that crippled the uh, South Vietnamese army, and same with with uh, Afghanistan, there was no yep. air support. And that's a big thing, because we always depended on air support yeah. for anything that we did. And we pulled the, our air support, because the Air Force, if, if the Air Force wasn't that big. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it just, it's just one of those yeah. things. So, um, the, uh, the president said, and, and this is diplomatic speech, it's not in our vital interest to be in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it's not in our politically or, or strategic interest to be in sure. Afghanistan and other countries. People forget we we're involved in 200 countries. It's not just Afghanistan. Yeah. We're everybody thinks that you know Afghanistan, Afghanistan. I mean, we were at war in Afghanistan, but it, is it in our vital interest? Right. And that and that's diplomatic talk. I mean, and I I picked up that when the president was saying that. Yeah, and I think. Um for me, on a more practical level, the question always was, does another American death equal success in Afghanistan? And yeah. there's no amount of blood no, or I treasure agree. that would have gone into that country um, that would have prevented that ending. And I do, we entered into uh, a war to do one thing, and we ended up moving into nation building. But we did, we, we, as a country, we did take on that responsibility. So somebody that was born in 2001 in Kabul for 20 years, mm -hmm doesn't know any Taliban mm -hmm. until now. Now they know the Taliban. And all they know is Americans. And they had this opportunity. They, they, they improved Educate, Kabul. Educated. The education. Them. People learned how to oh, read. read. Yep. Um, so when we did leave, I also felt like the promises that we made as soldiers, I could stop touching my mic. Yeah. Um, the, sold, the, the promises that I made and other soldiers, and thousands and thousands and thousands of other soldiers made to these people that we are the United States. We don't leave people behind. When this happened and everything collapsed, um, I think that promise was, while not America's promise, yeah. was most definitely Americans' promise. But when it ha it's a sa if you study uh, Vietnamese war, it's the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. We promised people, and then we, we left. I mean, it, it's, you well, know. You know, you brought that up, and kind of where we're at now, I'm, you know, I'm still trying to get families out. It's a little bit slower. It's mm -hmm. not as hard as the, yeah. well, it's different kind of hard than the, the emergency part of it, mm -hmm. uh, the phase two stuff. Um, but, you know, people don't realize that the Vietnamese, the refugees that came from Vietnam, are one of the most politically active um, ethnic groups in the United States. And they came here as refugees and recognized, yeah, they recognize how special what we have is, uh, which sometimes I feel like even a lot of Native Border Americans miss. I want to ask you this question. I have less than a minute. All right. Are you glad we were out? Yes, 100%. 100%. Everybody knew it. And every, everyone. So everyone. most Afghan veterans understood yeah. the calamity that we're out of there. So it was time. Yeah, it was time uh, to go. And that's what I thought, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for being on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I'm sure that uh, some people in general.